All right, item number four. Now, we're not going to go through uh, every single one of these necessarily, but uh, I do want to spend some time uh, certainly on uh, uh, item number four. It's, uh, it's incredibly uh, important by the time I, uh, I lay out why I think it's important, particularly in today's uh, complex globalized economy. I, I hope you'll come to agree with me uh, that, that it's important. It's not just that, that it's important, this principle, which is laid out in bullet number four here on this particular slide, it's that it is incredibly relevant to this day. It, it, its importance continues uh, into uh, the modern context. Number four, consumers inform themselves about products and make rational decisions. Right? The easiest thing in the world, right? Uh, this is kindergarten stuff. But let's, let's dwell on this and think about this a little bit more. Consumers inform themselves about products, right? They do their homework. At least this is the theory, right? Ideally, consumers do their homework about products. They compare this product at this quality at this price against that product at that quality at that price, right? And then they make rational decisions. Uh, so, in Wealth of Nations and in uh, classic economic theory, uh, particularly moving forward with Malthus, Ricardo, uh, John Stuart Mill up to this day, you have this notion, uh, one of the core, one of the core uh, uh, precepts of capitalist theory is that the individual market participant, right? The buyer, the seller, you, me, we are rational. We make rational decisions <clears throat> now there the, what's what's implicit in number four but but i, I don't i don't uh, make it real clear i i want i want us to be able to tease it out right i want us to be able to understand that it's there and and, and to parse the words but what's implicit in this i argue is that for consumers to inform themselves to be properly informed, that requires something. It is predicated on something else uh, being in, in existence, and that is information, data about the product, which is itself accurate. And so uh, this particular takeaway uh, of that I suggest is valid from a Wealth of Nations, uh, number four on this particular slide. What I'm getting at here is the market failure that Adam Smith points out in the Wealth of Nations that we generally refer to as the problem of inadequate information. A market economy cannot long exist, uh, not in any robust, efficient way if there is a prevalence of information in the marketplace which is inaccurate. Uh, how, how, does, how does this relate to the modern, uh, to the modern context? Well, the, the, obvious, the obvious example would be uh, a false advertising, right? There are laws now, and there have been in this country at least for, uh, for some time, about 100 years, in some, in some cases uh, over 100 years, uh, making it illegal to knowingly falsely advertise something about your product or to knowingly falsely uh, adver uh, say in your advertisement uh, something uh, which is uh, inaccurate about your competitor's product. But, but there, there's another aspect of how the market failure of ade uh, adequacy of information or inadequate information has been incorporated into American uh, commercial society. Uh, and for you, mar uh, not marketing, for you uh, finance uh, students, this will be, uh, I think, of particular interest, or at least, uh, at least it should be. If you stop and think about it, one of the areas in American, uh, uh, in American corporate culture where government and the private sector uh, uh, interface the most is in the area of governmental regulation of corporate securities. So, you know, finance majors uh, pay particular attention here. Uh, the government regulates uh, uh, pretty significantly in the area of 
of financial securities, right? Uh, corporate uh, uh, debt and equity instruments, stock certificates, right? Why? Uh, in short, because of the Great Depression. It's because of the Great Depression that Congress uh, enacted the Securities and Exchange Act of 1933 and the Securities and Exchange Act of 1934. 33 and 34 were near the end of the Great Depression, right? And it's in these two acts that the Securities and Exchange Commission is established and the principal job among many of the SEC to this day, of course, is to uh, oversee and regulate the accuracy and the adequacy of material information that publicly traded companies uh, uh, must disclose to the investment community. So in the United States and in other mature uh, uh, finance economies, it is absolutely uh, uh, required that uh, certainly publicly traded uh, companies where you have large, uh, uh, large markets of, uh, of investors and would be investors because they're publicly traded, right? You and I could buy, uh, could buy shares online now, right? Publicly traded. Um, uh, the, the government regulates in this area to make sure that the Coca-Colas and the Apples and all the other big uh, uh, companies, that when they say something about their company, right? Uh, which after all, is often designed to to entice us to buy shares in that company that the representations that they make about their company got to be accurate no misleading of investors is allowed and we learned that lesson the hard way through the great depression so near the end of the great depression the american economy is in shambles right and so congress determines that it's going to have some hearings to try and figure out how in the hell did this happen. And among the, the conclusions that they arrive at is that one of the things that um, maybe not caused the Great Depression, but certainly made it uh, worse than it needed to be, uh, was the fact that in the absence of any regulation, of any licensing of, of who is permitted to sell uh, uh, corporate stock certificates, as an example, well, what do you think, what do you think would happen? If there are absolutely no rules whatsoever about who can sell stock certificates, anyone who wants to make a buck is going to try and sell stock certificates, right? Well, what ended up happening, uh, Congress determined, was you had a lot of guys running around, right? This is the Wild West, uh, totally unregulated, no laws or regulations in this area at the time. You had a lot of people running around selling stock certificates to companies that didn't even exist. Back then, you couldn't go on. We're talking, you know, 80 years ago, more. You couldn't go online uh, and, and, you know, go to NASDAQ and say, hey, your company doesn't even exist. Get the hell out of my house. You're trying to sell me, you know, bogus stock. There's no way of telling back then, right? You'd have to uh, jump on a horse and buggy or a train, right? Or one of these one of these newfangled things called an automobile and drive all the way to New York City and find out whether or not the company really exists or not. So a lot of people were trying to get in on the action. Right, uh, uh, America in the 20s uh, after World War One, America's might is starting to grow. Our manufacturing capacity is starting to grow. You have big companies like the Ford Motor Company are starting to rise, and more and more Americans want a piece of the action. Right, so you've got a lot of moms and pops and you know uh, abuelitas. They want to buy some stock, but a lot of the stock that a lot of Americans end up buying is bogus. It's either stock. Uh, in a company that doesn't even exist, or uh, a lot of uh, unscrupulous uh, uh, salespeople with no morals whatsoever, clearly, they did this. Uh, they would sell stock to companies that actually did exist, right? Uh, but they would sell uh, stock to a, to a company that hadn't authorized that particular stock to be uh, issued uh, and on the market for purchase. What the hell does that mean? Well, let's stop and think about it. Let's break it down. Let's say uh, that um, uh, Acme Tool Company, uh, their board of directors has authorized the issuance of uh, a million shares of their stock, right? 
and so a million shares have been sold. Well, let's say that a bunch of guys are running around uh, the country and they are selling uh, stock to Acme Tool Company uh, beyond the million shares that the corporation actually authorized to be uh, issued and available for sale. For sale, let's say that that you've got a bunch of guys running around and they are selling uh, uh, worthless stock certificates that, on their face, in the aggregate, amount to uh, uh, let's say nine million shares in Acme Tool Company. Now there are ten million shares of paper stock floating around the market corporation only authorized 1 million shares. So if you have one of those shares, right, um, for the company to make good, right, if you go to redeem your share, to, if you go to the company and say, hey, I want to trade in my certificate for uh, uh, for the today's value of the share, right, the going price today, if the company had to make, uh, were to make everybody whole, the only way they could do that to every holder of a stock certificate would be to uh, would be to dilute the value of everyone's share. So if you hold a, a, a one share of Acme Tool Company under this hypothetical, what you, what you may get back, what is due and, and payable to you from the corporation, is ten percent of the of the stated value of your stock certificate. If your if your stock certificate says that this certificate is worth uh, uh, a thousand shares of stock, uh, and the par value is a dollar per share. Then that piece of paper should be worth a thousand dollars. But now you've got ten times as much paper stock floating out there because ninety percent of it was never authorized. Right? It's bogus, but it's out there. Uh, and so now you don't you don't own a thousand dollars of stock in Acme Tool Company. You own a hundred dollars one-tenth right because uh because of the oversubscription the unauthorized oversubscription uh, of uh of acme tool uh, company that actually happened uh during uh, the 19 teens and 20s and 30s and it exacerbated and made worse uh an already horrific uh, economic situation so the point of all of this uh is 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 someone in congress realizes hey you know this sounds familiar uh, didn't Adam Smith write about this in Wealth of Nations? Isn't this something called a market failure? Uh, uh, doesn't this type of scheming uh, uh, and, and bilking of millions of Americans out of their life savings, making the depression worse, uh, doesn't this represent the problem of inadequate information in the marketplace? And so Congress determines that what, need, what they need to do is to intervene in the marketplace in order to address an existing market failure uh, for the benefit of the market, market confidence, uh, and market participants. And so from then on to this day, you have to be licensed, you have to take tests, uh, you have to have a, a, a certain kind of, uh, of ethics training. Uh, and, and a background check in order to be able to uh, sell securities. And corporations uh, are under uh, very strict uh, uh, guidelines and conditions on what they can say and how they say what they say about the condition of their corporation. And so now, particularly you finance majors, you know this or you're about to find out, one of the main things that people do in finance is crank out paperwork uh, that is uh, that the SEC requires uh, that then is forwarded to the SEC and posted instantly for the whole world to see. Uh, there are 10 uh, uh, quarterly reports, 10Ks, annual reports, you know what I'm talking about. And financial and other type of data has to be disclosed to the market by uh, publicly traded and, uh, and certain other major companies above a certain revenue threshold. And they need to disclose fully and accurately all material information about the company, right? And for example, if the CEO has ever been uh, indicted, uh, indicted for embezzlement, they got to disclose that. Wouldn't you want to know? So would I. That's the point. Congress is trying to make sure that adequate information is in the marketplace 
just as Adam Smith said.